I'm here with Jonathan Levine. He's co-managing partner of Bain Capital, which manages 85 billion across PE, credit, public equity, VC, real estate, you name it. And our focus is Bitcoin. Just kidding. <laughs> from the video. Uh, our focus here is learning from the cycles, uh, cycles, trends, and forces that are impacting global investing. So Jonathan, we try to learn from previous cycles. Seeing as the last cycle is pretty momentous, I'm going to start with the deceptively simple question of where are we in the credit cycle? That is deceptively uh, simple. So I will give a deceptively oversimplified answer. I don't know. Um, Very honest. I think nobody can know. Um, I can describe the characteristics of what defines the cycle now and what we're looking out for. Uh, right now, obviously, credit spreads are tight. Um, and the risk curve is fairly flat. And the yield curve is pretty flat. All that would suggest, with the exception of the, of the yield curve, which I'll get back to, that the market is pretty optimistic that we will have low defaults, that uh, not a lot of bad things are going to happen in the United States, and that it's going to be pretty benign for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> people forget in high yield, the first cousin would be the equity markets. And therefore, there should be a lot of companies that should be able to exit and improve and, and potentially go to investment grade. Um, at times like this, you need to make sure that you are being extra careful looking for excess. Because when this happens, what's going to send the market off the rail. The market does not work in, in a perfect linear format. It goes from being perfectly benign to less benign to, uh-oh, uh, 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 there's a problem. Uh, what we look out for is, because the market seems pretty, pretty benign right now, excess creeps into the market. Mm -hmm. And more and more um, aggressive documents show up. People are taking more risk, more leverage. And if you think about, the first warning side we saw back in 07, there was a hung bridge all the way back in actually June of 07, July of 07, long before Lehman went under, long before people were really starting to talk about subprime mortgages. But it was the first sign of excess. Then you started seeing more leverage creep into the system. So that's so what we're going to look out for. The warning signs are there. You talk about the creeping up of excess. Are US credit spreads a reliable indicator still when we've had so many years of monetary policy experimentation? I mean, equity valuations have gotten stretched because of this uh, excess accommodation, as, as some would argue. So is, is that a reliable indicator for where other asset classes go next? Um, I still think they are. I think that US credit spreads, spreads are um, almost always the canary in the coal mine. The question is how fast they can turn. Mm. Uh, the second thing is there is an anomaly that we see in the markets, which is triple B spreads, which are the lowest quality investment grade spreads. Historically, you've seen in the triple B market, it's been about the same size as the high yield market, a one to one ratio. And in this low interest rate market, investment grade companies have taken huge advantage of the ability to issue cheap debt. And therefore, the ratio of triple B um, bonds to high yield bonds are now 1.7 to one which suggests there might be an excess of, um, an excess of issuance there. Mm -hmm. And if there's any weakening in the market and those companies get downgraded, you're going to see a huge increase of supply into the high yield market. And I'm not sure how we deal with that. And it is almost always an imbalance in supply and demand that leads to the cycle. OK, so the warning signs that we've been looking for. You mentioned how quickly things can turn. I look at what happened in Europe. Uh, political uncertainty in Italy recently turned to mild panic or relatively <laughs> quick panic. If you look at a chart of Italian bond yield spreads, they were super tight. There was a correction uh, last Tuesday. They've since settled down a bit. You've made the point to me that it's never as good as it looks or as bad as it feels. Um, it's tempting to think that there are parallels to what happened in Greece a couple years ago, which of course endured its own existential crisis. Would that be the right roadmap to use here? Yes. I think that in the absence of any information, I think that one of the problems we have is because the markets have become so numb to what, do, what is bad information, there's been so many things over the last couple of years that nothing seems to bother the markets, 
that it's really unclear what the definition of bad information is. And the uncertainty in Italy, if you actually think about it, the market first panicked when they thought Italy was going to form a government that was objectionable, then panicked when they didn't form a government that was going to be objectionable. And then when the government that looked like the first government that caused the panic formed, it all came back together. So I think, that, I think that that truly is, it's never quite as good as it looks or as bad as it feels. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can take a lot of lessons from Greece. I think it's going to be incumbent on investors to take a look at the difference between the rhetoric and the actions, maybe not just in Greece. Um, I think that might be something globally we should pay attention Applicable to. Applicable in other markets. Applicable in other markets. Uh, and um, there clearly is an issue globally where governments are going to get more strident in their rhetoric, more strident in how they deal with multinational entities. But Greece actually looked pretty scary for a while, had a government that was using even more strident language and actually worked through it. And we saw really interesting trends. We invested through that time and saw that regular people on the ground still do business. Plumbers continued to have small, you know, do their work as small business people, and people still went to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean to underestimate the, the trauma that can be caused in these economies, but they still do move forward. Life went on. Life went on. Life went on. So how do you go about investing in Italy right now? Um, I think that you know people forget, like any other country, Italy has states. I think that there's different characteristics to the states in, in Italy. Some are more manufacturing oriented, some are more tourism oriented. Um, I think that, so we tend to focus on more manufacturing. I think that there's consumer oriented investments you can make. We prefer not to do those. There's industrial. I think there's a pretty good industrial economy in Italy. Um, and we've been participating a lot in working with banks and buying their non-performing mm -hmm. loans in the industrial and small and medium enterprise area and um, commercial real estate and trying to help um, restructure those because one of the best ways to get an economy going is to get lending going and to free up banks' balance sheets so they can get on with their business of loaning money and helping drive GDP. Where do the emerging markets fit in? And, and maybe this is the wrong question because it's such a broad category. I mean, obviously, you have idiosyncratic stories in Turkey and Argentina. China is a whole different animal in and of itself. Bain is very active in the Asia Pacific region overall. What characteristics do you look for before investing in specific markets there? So um, I will focus mostly on the Asia Pacific. We have in the private equity um, area um, invested in, um, in uh, Brazil and had a couple of very successful investments there, um, particularly in healthcare. Um, and uh, there's an example of a, a an industry that has a certain universality to it, which I think is uh, would be one characteristic. I think healthcare is something everybody needs, and there's certain basic and fundamentals to it. Uh, different uh, different regulations, obviously, from country to country. Um, but one of the things I always remind people is when you look at Asia, it isn't a thing. It's a lot of things. And there's different, there's different ways of doing business from country to country. And in the, in the credit space where um, my area of expertise um, and where I've spent most of my career, we're really looking for creditors' rights. Mm. Um, we're looking for um, you know, rule of law, court systems that will um, we don't even have to like the way it works, but it's got to work in a tangible way that the rules don't change and they move on um, in, a, in, a, in a timely way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really important, I think, for any emerging market to develop a court system and a creditor system that gives people faith to loan money. Because in the absence of a functioning lending market, it does not it, it does not work. In countries with commonwealth law, obviously, it's, it's quite simple. But even India right now is working very hard to implement the equivalent of a Chapter 11 system in a court system that would look like a US or a European, Northern European creditor system. And that will attract money and small business lending, which would be good.
Okay, so the legal infrastructure needs yes. to be there, and you need to be you need to have the confidence in it. Let's take a step back here after a global tour. Mm -hmm. um, there's a distinction between credit and business cycles. The credit cycle measures the expansion and contraction of access to capital, mm -hmm. and the business or economic cycle measures GDP contraction or expansion. What do you think is the relationship between the business cycle and the credit cycle? Because they're related, but they don't necessarily drive one another. And some have said that they influence one another, mostly at the extremes. Um, I think that that's true, except you can't have one without the other, I would say. Uh, if you look at any long-term chart, the growth of credit or expansion of credit in um, particularly a developed economy is directly correlated to the, or the growth of the economy is directly correlated to the growth of credit and the mm -hmm. function of a credit market. And then at the, um, at the ends, if credit grows too much, it starts being in, inversely related cause, because uh, um, the excess leads to bankruptcies. Um, I do think, as I said, it, it, can, it can lead. A credit, uh, credit can go bad um, because there's been a supply-demand problem. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's very narrow, like with uh, fiber in the early 2000s, energy um, in the 15, 16 time frame, where it really doesn't have an impact on the, <laughs> on the economy. Um, that said, going to a different area of credit, mortgages, it can have a massive impact on the economy and on the business cycle, like subprime mortgages, where it can take down the whole system. Mm -hmm. Going the other way, if the business cycle does turn and the economy turns down at a point in time where even credit has been extended normally, there's definitely going to be an increase in in bankruptcies, and that will take the credit cycle with it. So the two are very much intertwined. Um, and it doesn't always mean one takes the other with it, mm -hmm. but in the main, they're very related. They're very related. I ask also because in the US, you've got fiscal policy changes like the tax cut that was passed at the end of last year. Um, and people wondering whether that can extend the U.S. business cycle. Uh, so much of what companies do is driven by people's confidence in the world ahead of them. Uh, Jason Trenner of Strategist Research Partners has written about how business owners, investors in red states are more optimistic than those in blue states. Do you believe the tax cuts can extend the U.S. business cycle? Um, I think I'll make three points there. Uh, one is... Uh, you pointed out confidence. I do believe confidence can extend a business cycle. Overconfidence can kill it. Mm -hmm. Because overconfidence leads to excesses, the use of too much Are leverage. Are we there right now? Uh, I think we could be getting there. Because two, um, the tax cuts can help spur in the short run. You know, they kick in the first time and it's new, but then it laps itself and it's not new anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and three, the tariffs, if they stick, and it's unclear how long they'll be there, whether or not they're actually being implemented, and there's a lot about the tariffs we need to understand. Um, I've seen data that suggests that they could take away the effects of 50% of the tax cut. So, you know, if they're fully implemented in the Midwestern states, the red states, that the tariffs would start to have a negative effect. Mm -hmm. And whether it's 50%, 25%, I'm sure there's going to be, I mean, I, I don't think there's been a lot of people who have done the full study because the tariffs just came out and have caught a little, caught people by surprise. They're definitely going to have a negative effect. So you are going to have a drag on the economy from that. Okay, so th if there's going to be an offset uh, if, that, if those tariffs do go through. I want to segue here now to something that Bain is doing as well and how it links up to U.S. policy. Bain recently took on Harvard University's $3.4 billion real estate portfolio. You'll be managing the investments. Uh, you've hired the team. And you call this a strategic addition. Why did you make this move into real estate so late in the cycle when interest rates are rising? Some would argue it's, uh, the, the sector is already very well bid up. So um, this is um, an investment we would have done at any point in the cycle. Uh, we've been looking at the real estate market for um, 20 years. And uh, we were looking for a differentiated strategy that looked at niche, niche investments. They, they don't own any office towers in any metropolises. They uh, are structured by industry, much like we are, and look for niche and um, look for vertical in industries. Effectively, healthcare, life sciences, 
um, elder care, uh, uh, warehouses, things like that, some of which that are not um, susceptible to the same type of interest rate and cap rate movements like you might imagine. Uh, of course, all real estate is to some degree um, as office towers in Los Angeles, New mm. York, or London. So we liked very much the, um, the strategic way that they approach the business. Um, and we asked ourselves, we would not get into a business and hire 22 people because we thought it was the right time in the cycle. We would only do something if we thought that this was a strategic additive part to our business and not just because we thought it was interesting to be in real estate, but that these um, people on this team would add to the whole Bain Capital team across our businesses and vice versa. And we really felt that was the case with this was a really unique business opportunity that we, we, we think is going to be a great part of the firm for 20 years, not just for the next cycle. Well, help me break some news here. Bloomberg has reported that Harvard's contributing. Are you raising outside money for this fund? Um, I cannot comment on our fundraising, uh, <laughs> our, our fundraising plans. <laughs> that was a lawyer-endorsed response, though. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, you graduated from Columbia University. You're a very active alum. You're on the board of trustees. Unusually for a guy in finance, you're a humanities student. Uh, you majored in political science. You had a concentration in English literature. Talk about how this background shows up in the way you think about investing and you view the world, because it's not quite the same as everyone else. Sure. Um, the, I think that investors need to be thinkers. And I think you need to be aware of what goes on in the world. And it's about more than doing math in your head. And I always say that political science, one, just understanding, I mean, think how many questions you asked today that had to do with geopolitical issues. But also, it teaches you a certain amount of game theory mm -hmm. and just thinking through how one event affects another event. And, um, and uh, English literature, I, I joke, and all my English professors will die when I say this, but um, teaches you pattern recognition. And when you read novels and you study literature, you're looking for certain patterns and stories that are true for generations. And understanding how to combine those two things m makes a difference. And I did go on and get an MBA, but I do think the skills that they taught me as an undergrad at Columbia, and Columbia has a very strict core curriculum. Yes, so the great books and all that. Right, all students have to take a political theory class for a year. It's called the core curriculum. And, and uh, the equivalent of a great books uh, classics course for a year, um, and music and, um, and an art course for a year. They want to make sure that people are rounded thinkers when they go out into the world. And I think it's served me pretty well. And I bring all of this up because I wonder how much group think there is when it comes to identifying where we are in credit. Credit is very much a group of people. Um, it's, it's less disparate than the equity market, for instance. So I wonder how much that drives where prices are and how people respond to events. Uh, that is always, particularly in fixed income, where there's a lot of data and there's a lot of everybody can look at the same uh, leverage ratios and things like that. And in my last um, annual letter, I showed a picture of the moon landing. And I said to, um, uh, I showed it to everyone because I wanted to make the point, and this is a big lesson coming from 08, that just because you've never seen it before doesn't mean it's impossible or it can't happen. And I think we always have to ask ourselves, um, does this make sense? And this does not necessarily make sense because the person next to me at the road show loves it mm -hmm. or because everybody else is buying it. And I joke, because I didn't take a lot of economics in college, I have a tendency to reduce everything down to the most basic supply and demand. And I think that most problems in the markets actually boil down to people forgetting supply and demand at its most basic level. Subprime mortgages got levered, which led to artificial buyers. When the leverage came away, it all came crashing down, it all came crashing down until real ca crash cash buyers came in. The same with bridge loans. So I think if more people tried to simplify their analysis mm -hmm. rather than go out and complicate their analyses, I think we'd probably have fewer problems. All right, we've got 10 seconds left. Where is the supply and demand most lopsided across the economy, the world economy, world markets right now? 
That's a complicated one, but I continue to take a look at what's going on in the triple B part of investment okay. grade is where we're taking a look right now. All right, an actionable idea here from Jonathan Levine, co-managing partner of Bain Capital. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.